So, in this um, in this module, we have actually studied quite extensively about the inverter, right? That's the only logic gate we have looked at in this entire module. Question now is, what can I, what circuit can I construct with just an inverter? Okay, is there any useful circuit that I can construct with just an inverter? Of course, with NAND, NOR, and other gates, you can make any logic. There's no doubt about it, right? Or if I just give you a NAND, it's enough. You can make any logic. But with just an inverter, what can you do, right? So it turns out that there is one interesting circuit as follows. Right? I have a chain of inverters like this. Now what if I just connect the output of the last inverter back to its input? What do you think will happen? Ah, right? So, so what happens if n number of inverters, right? 1, 2, n. If n is 2, what will happen? It will basically just remain at whatever state it comes to, right? Because of noise or whatever, if there is a 0 at the first input, then the output of the first inverter will be 1. Output of the next inverter will be 0 again. That is fed back. It will remain in the stable state forever, right? However, if there is and there are odd number of inverters in this chain, right? Then what happens is, let's say that this is 0, okay? Then this basically will make the output of the first inverter toggle to a 1 after some delay, right? So this will become 1. Then this will become 0 after some delay, 1, 0. And then eventually because n is odd, this will switch to a 1, right? And, there, and since it's fed back, right, this will now change to a 1, right? And this will switch to a 0, 1, 0. And this will keep going on and on and on. And not surprisingly, this is called a ring oscillator. Okay. Now, where is this circuit useful? So, it turns out that when you manufacture a particular chip, send it for fabrication and you get it back, it's not guaranteed that all the transistors are going to come back from the fab as you had expected. Okay. So, what happens is I have a large circuit, right? Like that microprocessor that I showed you, which has 8 billion transistors and so on, right? So, it can so happen that when I manufacture these chips one after the other occur in a wafer right what is a wafer wafer is basically a circular thing where you have uh, the di diameter of this would be 300 mm okay it's a silicon huge silicon substrate okay and on that what you're going to do is you're going to manufacture your chips like this. So each block here is basically a chip. Okay. So on a wafer, you could have many, many chips like this. You know, some maybe uh, 10K or something. Depending on the size of the chip, you can manufacture a lot of these. Now, this particular chip here, chip 1, need not get manufactured with the same specifications on the transistors as chip 999. Okay, so if you look at it, this guy will have one particular bias in the manufacturing. Okay. Which means, what does that mean? So your level 1 model like we spoke about has a parameter VTH0, gamma, this, that. That VTH0 can shift. VTH0 can shift slightly, right? Instead of 
300 millivolt it can become 350 millivolt right all the transistors in that chip by the way that's what i mean here every transistor in this chip one can have a vth not of vth plus delta this magenta guy every transistor in this can have a vth of vth minus delta right so it's not guaranteed that all the chips that come back from the fab are going to come back in exactly the same specification that you had manufactured with, that you designed it with. So the first thing you need to figure out is where, how, I mean, how different are these transistors from my intended design value, okay? So what you do is in every chip, right? So what you see here is, this is my chip. I'm going to put a ring oscillator like this. Okay, with some odd number of inverters. Typically, this will be a very large number because this. What's the frequency of oscillation, by the way, of this ring oscillator? Huh? What is f by n? No, no. So if if a if the input switch to a zero at time equal to zero, how long will it take for the input to switch to a one? Huh? So let's assume that the delay across each inverter is tau. Okay. So what is the delay for the zero to propagate across all in inverters? N tau, right? N tau. Now, what is the frequency of operation? One by? Ah, 1 by 2 n tau because now that 0 has to become 1, 1 has to become 0. Right? So, if you look at the output of this ring oscillator, it will go like this. Right? This is too clean a waveform, but you know, it may even look like a sinusoidal waveform in reality, by the way. This delay for output to go from 0 to 1 is basically my n tau. This is another n tau. Therefore, the frequency of operation is 1 by 2 n tau. <coughs> okay. So, let us do a quick calculation. If n is 30 picoseconds and let us say, uh, I mean tau is 30 picoseconds, n is 11. What is the frequency of operation? somewhere in gigahertz, right? The problem is if I have an, a signal that is oscillating like this at high frequency, I cannot bring this out of the chip. What will come out of the chip is only somewhere in megahertz, okay? So you have to do a lot of things to first of all, get the signal out of the chip, okay? If you want to do on-chip measurement, that's a different story, right? But if you want to get this out of the chip and ma make a measurement outside, then you have to slow this down significantly. So, therefore, what people do is they choose very large n. First, so that the frequency itself is in some reasonable, it will still be somewhere in the hundreds of megahertz range, right? Further, what you do is you put a divider, frequency divider, right? By 2, by 4, by 8, and then you bring it out, right? So, after all that, you can, you can bring this oscillating signal out from the chip, okay? So, therefore, you put a ring oscillator which has large number of stages followed by a divider also. And you get this out on a pad. Okay, this is will be called ring oscillator out. Okay. So, you can observe this on an oscilloscope, right? Or you know, the tester can do an automated measurement, whatever it is, and you can find out what the frequency of operation is. Now, if all your transistors have gone from Vt to Vt plus delta, what will happen to the delay? 
every transistor has had has got a higher vt now so what will happen to the current first of all it will decrease right vgs minus vt is where it appears if current decreases what will happen to the delay increase right it's c delta v by i you remember that that expression right so therefore the delay will now increase okay so the, the ring oscillators are therefore used primarily as global process monitors okay i'll tell you what global is global process monitor what does global mean here it means that every transistor in this chip has moved by the same amount the vt or all the process parameters right it's not just vt by the way it could be the channel length it could be the oxide thickness every single model parameter has moved in the same direction and therefore this is called a global shift in process or manufacturing variations okay now chips are now quite large that even within a chip i could have these variations okay so what are the origin of these variations first of all okay process process variations so you take a transistor okay and this is my you know gate n plus p oxide thickness and all that right so first of all we are now trying to manufacture physical dimensions of what order of magnitude 14 nanometer 20 nanometer and so on unfortunately the wavelength of light that is used to do this process of lithography is 192 nanometer it's much larger than the dimension that we are trying to manufacture so how are these things manufactured you basically make a mask and then shine light the shadow that is cast is supposed to you know hide some places and expose the other areas but because the wavelength is 192 nanometer and you're trying to do manufacturing of 14 nanometer 20 nanometer and so on you will have diffraction okay so what happens is it is impossible to manufacture a million transistors right 8 billion transistors are there in my in my chip and across the wafer also impossible to manufacture all of these with exactly the same length so each transistor technically can come out with a slightly different channel length okay this L itself can now change because of lithography problems. Other thing is, we derived the expression for the Vt, right? You remember it goes as square root of Na, where Na is basically the dopant concentration of the P substrate. Now it goes as square root of Na. The, we made a big assumption there that every dopant atom has got ionized appropriately right under the channel we are assuming that every single dopant atom has got ionized properly now let us see how many dopant atoms do you think will be there under the channel order of magnitude 10 1 million 1000 10000 10 power okay let's now what is na by the way na is about 10 power 15 per centimeter cube. This is a typical dopant concentration. So I'm asking you how many dopant atoms are there under the channel. Order of magnitude. Yeah. Like let's say 10,000, 1 lakh, million, million, 10 power 6, right? Okay, go back and do this calculation. Assume that the channel length is maybe 22 nanometer, width is about 44 nanometer, right? And you can assume this depth to be some even one micron. Go back and do it. You will find that the answer 
number of dopant atoms under a channel is about 100. 10 power 15 I know looks very large but that's across 1 centimeter cube. If I take 1 centimeter cube of volume, I have 10 power 15 dopant atoms. This is a very 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 small fraction under the channel. Now think about this. If I have 100 dopant atoms and 10 of them are not ionized correctly, which means there is a defect. They are not participating in terminating the electric field or whatever it is. They cannot give me a free electron. What will happen to the Bt? It has to go up because I, I have to put in more effort to get other dopant atoms to give me, you know, more free electrons. I have to deplete the channel more and all that stuff, right? So, when you start making the channel smaller and smaller and smaller, you also have this effect of random dopant fluctuation. Okay? So, one is litho changes. Okay, two is called random RDF. Now, suppose I had a long channel device. Okay, why is this not a problem in a long channel device? Suppose I had like 10,000, I mean, long enough channels so that I had about 1,000 atoms dopant atoms under the channel, right? For 100, I said 10 were failure because typically root n will fail. So if it is 1000, what is root n? Huh? 30, right? Somewhere 30, 40. Now in 1000, if 30 fails, nothing really changes, right? So this random dopant fluctuation is a big problem only for these Minimum size devices, very, very small devices. If I have a large width also, this effect will go away. Okay. So, in fact, the standard deviation of Vt due to random dopant fluctuation goes as 1 over root of L into W. Which means that if I have a larger area, right, like I told you, it means I have 1000 atoms. In 1000 atoms, if 30 fail, not much will happen, which means that the standard deviation, right? So if I take 10,000 devices and plot the histogram, I'll get a spread in the VT, right? If I plot the histogram, the VT will look like this, right? In a Gaussian shape and somewhere here, this is my sigma VT. Sigma VT goes as 1 by root of L into W. So the variations come down if I have a larger device, okay? So the source of variations are so many such factors, okay? And therefore, I could have variations between two wafers. I mean, between two dyes on a wafer, right here, chip 1 and chip 2 can have different parameters. Within the chip, I could still have variations, which means that the ring oscillator sitting at this corner will be different from the ring oscillator sitting at this corner. Right? So, typically what people will do is they will put ring oscillators in multiple locations on the chip if it's a big chip. Okay? They will put one RO here, one RO here and maybe one RO in the center also. And all of these will be accessible through pads. So, the first thing you do is get the chip back, measure these parameters of the ring oscillator. If the frequency is not as what you had thought it was, it means there is a drift in the process parameters, then you can correct for this appropriately, which means that if you know, for example, that all transistors have become slower because VT went up, then I can increase my VDD slightly. These corrections can happen. Okay. So ring oscillator is primarily used as a process monitor, both for within die variations. This is called a within die variation. Within the die, two different points can have different variations, right? It, it is also used as a global process monitor in the sense that every transistor on that die will basically have the same variation, but it can change from die to die, okay? Now, the other thing is, this is from your designer's perspective. 
from the fab perspective i need to guarantee to the designer that my process is not shifting over time means we means that i have told you that the vt is going to be at this particular value the current will be at this particular value and so on now with time if this just keeps drifting away that's not good so the the fab also has to monitor this right so how does the fab do it right because remember real estate space is very 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 expensive so for example the fab cannot say look i will i will use this one particular chip to figure out if you know my my process is correct or not that's too expensive you are wasting the very expensive real, real estate space also by monitoring just one corner it's not going to help i need to monitor it everywhere right so what the fab does is in this wafer here this is actually the place where the wafer will be diced it means you're going to cut it right you will cut it on these directions and send this chip back to the customer but before you cut it you have access to that space okay this space is called the curve all this is for your information by the way it's not like you know I'm not going to ask this somewhere in the exam so that you just get a complete picture of what happens from the fab and the designer's perspective this curve is where i will cut so what the fab will do is in this curve region they will put their ring oscillators here multiple ring oscillators in all curve regions so the fab what it does it manufactures a wafer gets all the dice then they make measurements on all these curve structures if the process has shifted significantly it's a problem it's a red flag so the moment they see that the process variation is more than the acceptable limit they will have to go back and debug and correct the manufacturing process so that it doesn't continue right so you make measurements here make sure everything is fine and then you cut it ring oscillator it doesn't matter after that. because once you have made the measurement you can as well reach it clear so it's interesting that a simple circuit with just inverters actually has so many uses okay so it's it's sort of a brief overview of what process variations are and why you have to deal with it in in the as a designer okay any questions here okay so we'll stop here i'll see you tomorrow at 9 thank you